Welcome, mortals, to the shadows of the unknown. I am Detective Grimm, seeker of darkness and unraveler of sinister mysteries. Today, we delve into the realm of horror, where brutal and mysterious crimes lie dormant, waiting to be exposed. In my line of work, I've witnessed the most gruesome tales, where malevolence and enigma intertwine like an ancient dance. Now, the person we will talk about was once a lovely child named Mary Bell. By the time she reached eleven, darkness consumed her, leading her down a path of unspeakable acts, and she became a serial killer. But why? What sinister secrets lurked beneath her innocent facade? Let us uncover the dark reason and reality behind her story. Let's delve into Mary's tumultuous childhood. She was born in England, in an impoverished slum area in the west end of Newcastle known as Scotswood. Her mother's name was Elizabeth Betty Bell, who was just 17 years old at the time. Betty had gained a notorious reputation as a local prostitute, which often led her to be absent from the family home. She frequently traveled to Glasgow for work, leaving her children in the care of random people or, at times, even alone. Can you imagine the distress of leaving a three- to four-year-old child alone at home or, worse, with just anyone? Such neglect and abandonment cast a haunting shadow over Mary. As a young baby, you need affection, love, attention, and a nurturing environment to grow up as a productive, happy, and well-natured child with great mental health. However, Mary received none of these blessings. She was an unwanted and neglected child from the very beginning. According to her aunt, I.S.A. McCricket, within minutes of Mary's birth, her mother resented hospital staff when they attempted to place her daughter in her arms, and she even shouted at them, saying, Take this thing away from me. During Mary's infancy, she frequently suffered injuries and household accidents while left alone with her mother, leading her family to believe that her mother was either deliberately negligent or intentionally attempting to harm or even kill her daughter. She resorted to horrifying acts to rid herself of Mary. On one occasion, she callously pushed the defenseless child from a first-floor window, by some miracle, Mary survived the fall, though she endured a broken left leg and deep head injuries. Not content with her previous attempts, Mary's mother stooped even lower. She tried to end Mary's life by giving her sleeping pills, hoping her innocent daughter would never wake up. Despite her mother's sinister intentions, Mary once again defied fate and survived, becoming both lucky and unlucky at the same time. In an act of unspeakable heartlessness, her mother even sold Mary to a mentally unstable woman who longed for a child of her own. The sale was driven solely by Mary's mother's desperation for money, showing an utter lack of care for her own daughter's well-being. It was Mary's Aunt Catherine who proved to be the beacon of hope in this dark tale. Braving the challenges, she embarked on a journey across Newcastle to rescue Mary from the clutches of this unstable woman and return her to the familiar walls of her mother's home on White House Road. Determined to put an end to the suffering, Aunt Catherine sought custody of Mary, but her pleas were met with rejection every time. The depth of her mother's depravity knew no bounds, as she shamefully allowed, and at times even encouraged several of her own clients to sexually abuse Mary for extra cash, as when a person loses all sense of morality, they become unrestrained by guilt, fear, or remorse, paving the way for destructive decisions. This toxic environment had a profound snowball effect on Mary's mental health. As she transitioned from an innocent child to a fully grown adult, the once promising baby plant failed to blossom scented flowers, instead, it was left with nothing but thorns. At both home and school, Mary displayed numerous signs of disturbed and unpredictable behavior, which included sudden mood swings, a common effect of unstable mental health, even in adults. She also engaged in frequent fights with other children, irrespective of their gender, and attempted to strangle or suffocate her classmates or playmates on multiple occasions. On one occasion she even tried to block the trachea of a young girl with sand. Due to her violent tendencies, many children became wary of socializing with Mary, leading to isolation both at home and outside, exacerbating her situation further. The rumors surrounding her behavior only widened the gap between her and her classmates, leaving her feeling utterly alone. However, Amidst the turmoil, Mary found solace in a friendship with Norma Joyce Bell, the 13-year-old daughter of a neighbor. Although the girls shared the same surname, they were not blood-related, the girls spent a lot of their free time together outdoors. While there is no information on whether Norma knew about Mary's temper and mood swings, they remained very close.
On Saturday, May 11, 1968, two police officers on patrol duty discovered a dazed and bleeding three-year-old boy wandering near St. Margaret's Road in Scottswood. Acting quickly, they rushed the child to the hospital, where it was revealed that he had broken both of his legs and sustained severe lacerations to his head. After regaining consciousness, the child informed the police that he had been playing with Mary Bell and Norma Bell on top of a disused air raid shelter when he was suddenly pushed from the roof to the ground. However, he was unsure which of the girls had actually pushed him. The same evening, the parents of three small girls contacted the police to report that both Mary and Norma had attempted to strangle their children as they played in a sandpit. That evening, both Mary and Norma were questioned by the police regarding these incidents. Both girls vehemently denied any wrongdoing in the air raid shelter incident, claiming they had only found the bleeding boy and had offered help and directions for him to seek assistance. When questioned about the attempted strangulation of the three young girls, Mary denied any involvement. However, after officers personally visited Norma's house and applied pressure, she finally confessed that Mary had indeed tried to strangle each of the girls. She provided a detailed account of what had transpired. According to Norma, while they were playing in the sandpit, Mary suddenly went to one of the girls whom she had been staring for a long time and said, What happens if you choke someone? Do they die? Mary then proceeded to place both hands around the girl's throat, causing her to slowly turn purple. Despite Norma's pleas for her to stop, Mary persisted. The same pattern was repeated with another girl named Pauline, who tried to intervene, and also with a third girl named Susan Cornish. The police reported the incidents and Mary's violent behavior to the local authority. However, due to their young age, both girls received only a warning, and no further action was taken. Mary was just 10 years old at the time, and the authorities believed there was little they could do. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a grave mistake, as if appropriate action had been taken or even if they had closely monitored Mary, her next victim might have been spared from the tragic fate of death. On May 25, 1968, in the neighborhood filled with abandoned Victorian houses, four-year-old Martin Brown was invited to play with Mary Bell and her friend Norma in one of these abandoned houses. Parents didn't actively prevent their children from playing there, but they would often advise them to be cautious and avoid getting hurt. Tragically, it was in this very abandoned house, located at 85 St. Margaret's Road, where Mary Bell strangled the innocent young boy. Martin's lifeless body was later discovered by three other children. Despite a nurse's attempts to perform CPR, it was too late. Mary Bell and Norma Bell were present at the scene, watching when the nurse arrived and performed CPR and were quickly asked to leave the house. Later, the two girls knocked on the door of Martin's aunt, Rita Finley, and delivered the devastating news, stating, One of your sister's sons has just had an accident. We think it's Martin, but we can't tell because there's blood all over him. During the investigation at the site, there were no visible signs of violence on Martin's body, except for specks of blood and foam around his mouth. However, a bottle of pills near his body led investigators to consider the possibility of accidental ingestion or the impact from something due to building's poor condition. The following day, Dr. Bernard Knight conducted a post-mortem on Martin Brown's body but found no signs of violence, making it challenging to determine the cause of death. However, he was able to rule out the investigator's theory that the child had died from ingesting tablets. As a result, the case was closed, and Martin's death was ruled an accidental one. Shortly before Martin Brown's funeral, both Mary and Norma visited his mother, June. They asked to see Martin. When June informed them of his death assuming that they don't know about Martin's death, but Mary chillingly responded, Oh, I know he's dead, I just want to see him in his coffin. This statement alone reveals that Mary had already crossed the threshold of sanity, and any chance of saving her seemed to have long vanished. A few days later, on Mary's 11th birthday, both she and Norma broke into a nearby nursery located in Woodland Crescent. Inside, they wreaked havoc by peeling tiles off the slate roof, tearing books, upturning desks, and splattering ink and poster paints all around before making their escape. The following day, when the nursery staff arrived and discovered the break-in, they immediately alerted the police. During the investigation, the authorities found four separate notes claiming responsibility for Martin Brown's murder. One of these notes stated, I murder so that I may come back, while the another read, We did murder Martin Brown, fuck off you bastard. A third note simply read, Fuck off we murder. Watch out Fanny and faggot. The final note was the most complex when read, You are mice why because we murdered Martin go brown you bet look out there are murders about by Fanny and old faggot you screws. 
The police didn't take this incident seriously and dismissed it as a tasteless and childish prank. Little did they know how wrong they were, and it wouldn't be long before Mary and Norma targeted their next victim. On the afternoon of July 31, 1968, a three-year-old boy named Brian Howe was playing in front of his house with his dog when two girls, Mary and Norma, approached him and joined in the play. Brian's parents didn't mind the company of the two girls and went inside their house. Little did they know that this innocent encounter would soon turn into a nightmare. Mary and Norma asked Brian to come with them and play at their place, and he innocently agreed. As the afternoon wore on, Brian's family became increasingly worried when he didn't return home. They immediately contacted the police, who launched a search for the missing child. Despite their efforts and those of a search party, Brian's body was tragically discovered later on. It was found wedged between two large concrete blocks in Tin Lizzy. Unfortunately, information about this location is not available, making it difficult to pinpoint the exact site. Continuing with the incident, the first policeman to arrive at the scene immediately noticed a poorly attempted concealment of the body. Brian's lifeless form was covered with clumps of grass and weeds. The child's lips had turned a haunting purple, and visible bruises and scratches adorned his neck. Strikingly, a pair of broken scissors lay near his feet. The observant officer deduced that Brian had tragically died due to strangulation. The size of the strangulation marks and the lack of strong force indicated that the perpetrator was likely a child. The conclusion was that the killer had used one hand to close Brian's nostrils and the other to grip his throat, causing his death. Moreover, during the examination of Brian's clothing and shoes, gray and maroon fibers were discovered, which did not match anything belonging to Brian or his family. These fibers were carefully preserved as crucial evidence in the case. In a chilling turn, a post-mortem examination revealed even more horrifying details. Puncture wounds were found on Brian's leg, and his genitals had been partially mutilated. A crude attempt had been made to carve the letter M on his stomach. The most distressing revelation was that all of these actions were carried out while Brian was still alive. The discovery of Brian Howe's lifeless body ignited a large-scale manhunt. More than 100 detectives from across Northumberland were assigned to the investigation, and by August 2nd, over 1,200 children had been questioned about their whereabouts. Even Mary and Norma were questioned since they had been seen with Brian before his tragic death. During the interrogation, Norma cooperated while Mary observed from a distance. Both girls mentioned that they had played with Brian but claimed ignorance about what had happened afterward. Although their statements were contradictory and evasive, they insisted that the scissors belonged to Brian. DCI Dobson, one of the officers, delved into Mary's past actions and couldn't shake the feeling that she might be the killer. However, he was only partially certain. The following day, he questioned Mary alone, putting pressure on her. Mary claimed that she had witnessed an eight-year-old local boy hitting Brian, both then rolled around in grass and weeds, and using the scissors to cut a cat's tail, which had its leg bent backward. To his surprise, Mary provided specific details despite previously claiming not to remember. Dobson's suspicion grew stronger when he asked her whose scissors were used, and she pointed to the boy who was later proven to be at Newcastle International Airport with witnesses to support his alibi. Later on, Norma's parents contacted the officer, stating that she wanted to confess. According to Norma, she wasn't present when Mary killed Brian, but Mary later took her to the body. As they stood there, Mary recounted in chilling detail how she had strangled Brian, expressing a disturbing sense of ecstasy as she watched the life slowly leave him, turning him blue. Norma also revealed how Mary had mutilated and carved the letter M on his body using a hidden razor blade, which was later seized as evidence. When the officer emphasized that Norma could also face legal consequences if she didn't speak the whole truth, she finally admitted that she was present during the entire horrifying ordeal. However, she claimed not to be actively involved. When asked why she didn't intervene or stop Mary, Norma chillingly replied, I was just asked by her not to. After this, the officer confronted Mary, but she denied everything, wearing a sly smile on her face. She confidently retorted, you're trying to brainwash me. I will get a lawyer to get me out of this. You can't take me to the police, I am underage. Oh, can you believe the genius at work here? Mary knew that the officer couldn't forcefully take her to the police or do anything without her lawyer present she knows all her rights I mean, how many of you guys were lawyers at the ripe old age of 11? 
Most of you were probably dreaming about crushes and navigating the changes of puberty. At the funeral of Brian Howe in the local cemetery, while everyone was gathered for the somber ceremony, Mary was lurking outside the house. As the coffin carrying the child was taken from the house to the cemetery, Officer Dobson was also present, and he later recounted in his report, She stood there, can you believe it, laughing. Laughing and rubbing her hands together with an eerie delight. I thought to myself, my God, I've got to bring her in. She'll do it again. Soon, both girls found themselves charged with the murder of Brian Howe. Mary's cold response was, that's all right by me, displaying her apparent lack of remorse. On the other hand, Norma broke down in tears and said, I never. I'll pay you back for this. In the aftermath, Mary provided a written statement admitting to being present during the murder but shifting the blame onto Norma. They both also confessed to the vandalism at the Woodland Crescent Nursery and writing those ominous handwritten notes. Following their arrest, psychological evaluations were conducted on both girls. The results revealed that Norma had intellectual delays and a submissive nature, displaying emotions easily. In contrast, Mary showed intelligence, but her cunning character and sudden mood swings were apparent. She would occasionally open up to conversations but quickly became sullen, introspective, and defensive. Though not diagnosed with a mental disorder, Mary displayed traits consistent with a psychopathic personality disorder. The trial lasted for nine days, and Mary was convicted of manslaughter for the deaths of the two children. The first victim's case was also reopened by Officer Dobson. During the trial, the judge described Mary Bell as a dangerous individual, emphasizing the very grave risk to other children she posed. It was clear that steps had to be taken to protect the public from her, leading to an indefinite sentence of imprisonment. On the other hand, Norma was found not guilty, and she couldn't contain her joy. While Mary cried in the background, Norma cheered and clapped. At 11 years and 6 months old, Mary Bell became Britain's youngest female killer, a record that still stands to this day. At 23 years old, after serving nearly 11 and a half years in custody, Mary Bell was granted anonymity and given a new identity in another part of the country. For years after her release, she became a mother to a baby girl. For a while, Mary remained forgotten, until 1988 when she collaborated with author Gitta Serini for the book, Cries Unheard, The Story of Mary Bell. In the book, she discussed the abuse she endured and shared details about her life before and after the crimes and accepted the punishment she received for her actions. To this day, Bell's current whereabouts remain unknown, protected by a 2003 High Court order that shields her identity. And now, as we reflect on this chilling tale of Mary Bell, a dark and mysterious figure, we're reminded of the shadows that lurk within human minds. May this story serve as a haunting reminder that evil can wear the face of innocence, and the legacy of her crime still casts a long shadow over the pages of history. Remember, evil can hide in unexpected places, and Mary's haunting tale serves as a stark reminder of the darkness within. Thank you for joining us in this unsettling exploration. Stay curious and beware of the secrets in the shadows, and see you in the next spine-tingling chapter. Farewell mortal souls, see you guys later, or perhaps sooner than you think.